Welcome to MuggleCast episode 435. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm uh, Micah. I'm Laura. And on today's episode, we are discussing Order of the Phoenix Chapter 3, The Advanced Guard. We're also going to fill everybody in on some fandom happenings. But we are also joined today by one of our Slug Club members, Christina. Hi, Christina. Hi, everyone. Hi. How's it going? Welcome to the show. Where do you live? I am in very warm Marietta, Georgia. Ooh. Wow, we are not that far apart. Won't you two get some coffee after today's episode? Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> yeah, I'm that weird Colombian who doesn't drink coffee. Oh. That's okay. Never mind that. You could always have some foreign tea. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, thanks for your support on Patreon. Let's get your fandom ID. All right. My favorite book and movie are both Sorcerer's Stones. Nice. That was my introduction. I am a Ravenclaw. My Patronus is a tortoiseshell cat. And my favorite member of the advance guard is naturally Remus Lupin. Mm. And we'll talk about him on today's episode of the show. That's why we asked you that question. First, some fandom happening. So we used to probably typically call these news items, but they're not worthy of the news title. But they are happening in fandom. So we should still bring them up. So, first of all, the official Wizarding World app is out. Has anybody here downloaded it yet? We we spoke about it a few weeks ago. I have not. I have not, but I checked the reviews this morning, and most of them are pretty dismal. Oh, people are already reviewing it, huh? Oh, yeah. Does MuggleCast have better reviews than the Wizarding World app in the Apple Store, I wonder? I would hope so. <laughs> We've been around just a little bit longer than they have. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's nothing really to talk about. It looks like it's just Pottermore within an app. There aren't any special features yet, but we'll keep an eye on it, see if um, they add anything interesting, like that new Sorting Hat quiz that they have been teasing. Here's the thing, Andrew. Give me a reason to download the app. Right. Yeah, I want to hear friends talking about it, going, you need this, mm -hmm. and here's why. Here's some more exciting information. Mina Lima, they are the graphic designers behind the Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts movies. They have released five different Harry Potter wallpapers, and they are freaking gorgeous. They have a Marauder's Map one, a Black Family Tapestry, the Hogwarts Library book covers, and uh, the Daily Prophet wallpaper. And Quidditch wallpaper. That one's like golden snitches against a blue sky. These are freaking so beautiful. I can't get over them. Yeah, this is this is really exciting. I know so many people who will be really heavily considering decorating their next room in their home with these wallpapers. Um, even like the, the newspaper thing I'm looking at right now is kind of a classic... Uh, habit for like either uh the bathroom would just have newspapers so you could read yeah you know in the bathroom and stuff so i i'm just thinking of this really ups the game for all of my friends who do uh home remodeling and like have just bought a place and will be decorating the details on these are just stunning yeah i'm actually looking at either the black family tapestry or the hogwarts library book covers because we are slowly but surely putting our office together and one of the things we want to do is we want to get floor to ceiling Hogwarts banners for our houses mm. uh, and have them in here. So this would be a nice addition. Yeah. And their photo for the Golden Snitches one looks very Toy Story to me. Uh, very. Toy yeah, Story. that looks like it's more for a kid's room. The yeah. other ones look like they're for adults, though. To be honest, I would probably put that one somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> The only problem is these are a little pricey. It's $110 per roll. Sure. But I guess that's what you would expect. This is official. This is probably printed on really high quality paper. But hey, it's worth it for the Instagram, right? <laughs> Think of all the likes you'll get. Exactly. Do it for the like. That's what I live for the like. Lethal White, the fourth book in J.K. Rowling's Cormoran Strike series, is now filming. Has anybody watched the show at all? Um I have it. I saw the first episode. That was the only one I could seem to find. I think, Micah, didn't you say they recently they were on HBO or was it maybe Showtime that they aired? Yeah. No, they're, they air on um, Cinemax. Cinemax. There you go. They were on, they were on the BBC in um, the UK. Yeah, that's where I saw them. 
Okay. And when they aired on Cinemax, it was just like, uh, who watches Cinemax? So I never watched it. If, 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 if it was on HBO, I would have probably been into it. But yeah, I haven't seen it either. Did you, you've seen it though, Micah? Maybe I caught a piece of it here and there. I, I don't have Cinemax, so. Yeah. No. No one does. It's too expensive. It's also has a, as a really interesting history as a station. <laughs> it's not always been called Cinemax, at least for most people. So uh, it's interesting <laughs> that that's where it's ended up of all places, but. I, would it not be on BBC America if you get that station? No, this is one of those things where the BBC and HBO, eh, it's too insider, it doesn't matter. But no, it's not on BBC America. Well, I did manage mm. to catch the Cuckoo's Calling adaptation, or at least I think the first half. They did, I think, a two-part, 90-minute in two-part kind of uh, production. Yeah. Uh, and I liked it. I thought the casting uh, of Robin was really well. The casting of Strike was also good, but... He's sort of a more good-looking dude than Strike is in the book. Uh, so he... Yeah, it seems like they de-aged him. Because in the book, you read Strike and you get the impression that he's older. Yeah. And not very good-looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they got a well, Hollywood Hold on a second. It. He's in his 30s in the book, is he not? He might be. He is. He might not be as old as I implied, but... Yeah, no, he's he is in his 30s, but what's always implied is that he's definitely uh a rough 30s yeah. you know <laughs> yeah this excellent. guy on the tv show is kind of cute but hey you got to do that for television you do so yeah that's now filming uh lethal white will i guess be on television next year and if you're into the books which i think we all are uh keep an eye on the tv series and finally there is a new dark arts show happening at universal orlando running for the halloween season um, this is one of those light shows projected onto Hogwarts Castle. None of us have seen it yet, but there was also a nighttime lights at Hogwarts Castle show, as it was called. And that was super cool. Eric, I know you saw that one recently. Um, the Stark Art show recently um, ran at Universal Hollywood, too. So this is an entirely new, but it's new for Orlando. Well, and in Hogsmeade now, in front of the three broomsticks, they have this uh, raised platform where actors as Death Eaters come out to music and fog. Like either I don't know if it's throughout the day. I don't know if it's like one of those shows like you're watching Celestina Warbeck or something over in Diagon Alley. But I've never seen or heard of actors as Death Eaters running around the park before. So that excited me. Uh, and it's all to promote this uh, nighttime show, which, as you say, did debut in California first. I think it was I think the uh, Death Eaters run around during the show kind of make to make it an immersive experience. Yeah, I've seen two but these videos. shows are also very short. So, <laughs> yeah, I've seen two videos of them doing it in the day, though. So that's cool. oh, like they're okay. running around. Okay. So I was like, well, that's not a nighttime show thing. So, yeah, yeah. cool stuff, though. And um, it's nice to see Universal embracing the darker side of magic for people who are so inclined. And they probably want to do a haunted maze because Universal theme parks are very well known for their Halloween horror nights. People love going to them. I've been to them a couple of times. Uh, but you you would think they'd have a Harry Potter one by now. They have The Walking Dead. They have Stranger Things. They have all these other classic horror movies. A Harry Potter one would be great. But I think uh, Team Wizarding World hasn't given them the green light on that yet, which is a bummer because that would be so cool to like go through the Forbidden Forest or... Uh, have some sort of Death Eater experience like this show. Definitely. Oh, well. They might think it's too tame. Too tame? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, usually these haunted mazes have like chainsaws and stuff, right? <laughs> All right. Well, a couple quick announcements before we move on. Are you subscribed to the show? I just looked at some stats and 12% of listeners aren't. That's crazy. So please subscribe so you never miss an episode. It's like getting an owl delivering some new Harry Potter goodness to your phone every week. And. This is some exciting news for some of our listeners. We are frequently asked by new listeners, why aren't there more episodes on the show on the feed? People discover MuggleCast. They're super into it. They start going back into our archive. And then it, it would end at like episode 210 or 12. Um, that is no more. The reason the older episodes weren't in there is because we used to delete them. I used to delete them. My bad. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what I was thinking at the time. But anyway, we've been re-adding them to the feed, and now the RSS feed goes all the way down to episode 59 from October 13th, 2006. And a few more are going to go in there. 
But um, whether you're a new listener or not, you may want to scroll through that feed because there are a lot of iconic MuggleCast episodes, including episode 100, which was our post-Deathly Hollows analysis episode. Um, the 12-hour live show is also in there now. <laughs> um, the classic episode titled Laura's Pants is there as well. Mike, oh, I know yes. you've been wanting to listen to that one. <laughs> wow. And uh, yeah. I've, I actually listened to it this morning before we sat down to record. <laughs> Every Sunday he yeah. turns it on. But but what is what happened there exactly, Laura? Do you want to explain? Didn't Eric have? Oh um, God. Yes. So we went to Los Angeles for the podcast awards. Yep. Was that it? Wow. Yeah. That was and early days. We had right? yeah. We had a couple of hotel rooms because we were there with Leaky. So we had like eight people that we had to accommodate, and I shared a room with Eric you micah and kevin i believe and i had a super early flight out the last day uh, much earlier than all of you it was still dark out when i left and so i'm like packing in a frenzy of course i'm like 17 and you know staying up all night every night so i'm just like frantically packing in like 10 minutes at the last moment before i get out the door and i forgot a pair of my pants in the hotel room and Eric very kindly mailed them back to me. But then in the middle of an episode, Eric just goes, hey, Laura, did you get your pants? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the end of the episode. I thought it was like a perfectly good episode talking about uh, upcoming Deathly Hallows. We we announce our book tour plans. I'm actually reading the thing in now. And then I th I thought I just mentioned it at the end, but then the episode was titled after it because I guess it was a funny moment or something. Yeah. Yes, well, it was just so out of context. Everybody uh, was like, what? Get... Why do you have Laura's pants? Yeah. Right. There were a lot of questions that came up. <laughs> so the, the title is misleading. <laughs> the ship began. It's not an entire MuggleCast episode about pants. It's just not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, not a chapter by chapter analysis on Laura's pants. Right. Not a thread by thread. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, lots of MuggleCast episodes now available on the feed. We're very excited to do that because people were asking at least once a month, get those old episodes back in the feed. So there will be a few more going in there. Unfortunately, there's a limit, 400 episodes, because of our podcast host. Hopefully, they'll change that. But right now, only four, the most recent 400 episodes will be able to exist in the feed. And only 400 Andrew, one other thing I would add to that is for listeners to check out the Wall of Fame over on MuggleCast.com. We've had a number of interviews over the years as well, and I think most of them are, are good enough to to check out. But we've spoken with the producer of, of the Potter films, David Heyman, that was back on episode 200, uh, David Yates, who directed half the films, Oliver Phelps, Ivana Lynch, Warwick Davis, and several others but those kind of stand out to me yeah yeah that's a great point mugglecast.com is where you can find that time now for some feedback we got a lot of comments about our discussion on foreign tea it turns out us four americans were missing a crucial meaning behind tea and why don't we hear one of our english listeners explain it to us hi guys mike here from england uh, although I'm actually living in China at the moment, teaching English. Uh, your podcast is great. I've been listening for about five years now. Uh, and especially here, it's really good to kind of keep in touch with the fandom and also kind of a bit of a taste of home um, away from home, which is really nice. So thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to make a quick uh, comment about uh, one of the discussions you were having last week when you were talking about the second chapter of Order of the Phoenix. Uh, now, as a Brit, I can understand why when... Uh, people from outside of the UK read tea, they think it means the drink tea, which is true, but also tea means dinner here in England. So when, um, when they say that Piers, or Dudley, sorry, is going to Piers' house uh, to have tea, they mean Dudley's going to Piers' house to have dinner, uh, which would also kind of make more sense out of when Vernon said, maybe they gave you some of the foreign tea, he actually means foreign food. Uh, which, again, doesn't necessarily make his comments right. But, um, yeah, it might just kind of help piece together what he meant a little bit more. Uh, so, yeah, just thought wanted to send that in, guys, uh, and see what you thought about it. Look forward to hearing the next episode, guys. Please keep up the good work. Uh, thanks again. Bye-bye. Oh. 
I Thank love you, this. Michael. That actually makes it make so much more sense. It does, but why would they call eating food tea? <laughs> <laughs> because I think I I think he's right that when you're having tea, there's often like accompanying food items with it. So I can see why you would sort of naturally sort of like call like, oh, we're sitting down for tea, meaning like we're going to have a meal. Right? Yeah. So Michael like, Michael asks, yeah. like, does it make the comment less racist? I think it does if it means that Vernon is saying Dudley just has like a weak stomach. Like, oh, I bet the like maybe he's actually giving the Polkas's credit for getting takeout from like Indian, Asian, you know, other countries versus maybe the Dursleys themselves just do like British, British meals, like your bangers and mash and all that. So I guess it's Irish. I I think it's still racist. Yeah. But <laughs> it, yeah, don't absolve Vernon here. It's, oh, I'm not trying. Still... <laughs> I'm not trying to absolve Vernon. I'm saying, you know, does what this information, what is the like, so having this context now, what do we then take to our chapter um, analysis from? I from? think what Andrew is trying to say is if you can change the name of an entire book, why not just say he got some bad food for right. us Americans yeah. here, right? Well, and I just think it's silly that you English folk uh, call food tea. Oh, it is not. Andrew, you're going <laughs> to. You, you went. You, you went know the for emails it. we're going to get now. You went for with it. all due respect. With all due respect, I just don't understand it. When I have a when I have food, I call it food. <laughs> you know what? I cannot wait for people to email in calling us out for dumb things that Americans say. Because <laughs> I'm sure it's out there. Like we're not considering it because we are Americans, but. I am sure that there's something that we say that to outsiders makes For sure. no sense. I bet it's aluminum. Aluminum. People oh, hate yeah. that we, we say aluminum. We say aluminum. Aluminium. <laughs> no, I, I would just even start with how everybody interacts with each other here in America. Sup. 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 Yeah, yeah. Jamie would always make fun of that. Sup, man. <laughs> well, what, what is sup? I, I want to know. Um, and to sup is to eat. So there you go. That's that's a full circle. <laughs> sup, supper. <laughs> supper. No, you know what I love about this, though? This is evidence of the fact that as the books went along, they stopped Americanizing them so much. Yep, I hate it. Um, yeah, I hated when they were doing that early on in the series. Oh, no, I wanted them to do it. I hate that they stopped. I really. No, yeah. These are like quintessentially British stories. Tra Let them be British. Trainers. I always think of like a personal trainer, like Harry's got like a physical therapist that he's lacing up. That's a problem for me, I guess. But... Oh, you know what? That's actually a good one. Why do we call them sneakers? What yeah, is what are we doing? Sneaking? Yeah. What does that even mean? Well... See, I actually grew up calling them tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tennis shoes too. I, I grew up calling them sneakers because that's what my parents called them. Mm -hmm. And once I got, you know, to a certain age, I was like, but Why? Why why do we call them this? What is what is the history of this word? I I would be in favor of. I know I every time a new Harry Potter book cover comes out, I'm like, nah, nah, we don't need another one of these. But if they if the if the if they got the American translators to just do books five, six, and seven, I absolutely would buy. Like the hey, here we're gonna hold your hand, American kid. Uh, change every tap to faucet. Change mad to crazy. Uh, everywhere. Because it just it mm. it's it's a difficulty of understanding issue. I have issues comprehending foreign things, so I could just either have an open <laughs> mind or I could buy these hand holding editions it's, that I want. It's barely foreign, though. I mean, they're still speaking the English <laughs> language. It's just they have different words, just like trainers versus sneakers, yeah, tea versus food. Apparently, anyway. Well, thank you, Michael, for calling in with that. By the way, I think he recorded a voicemail on his phone and then emailed that in. That, that was obviously very good quality. So if anybody ever wants to do that, just record a message with your voice memos and just email it to us. We can play that on the show instead of uh, that phone line quality that you get when you use our number. Micah, do you want to read this email from Jeff? This is in defense of Mundungus. Oof. All right. So Jeff says, I just wanted to put in a quick defense of Mundungus and Dumbledore's decision to employ him as a lookout on Privet Drive. First of all, both J.K. Rowling and Dumbledore have made a point throughout the books not to underestimate someone based on their appearance or superficial qualities. From the lowly house elves, Dobby and Creature, to the unassuming Neville, 
the convict Sirius Black, the werewolf Lupin, former Death Eater Snape, and Muggleborn Hermione, we are constantly reminded not to take someone at face value. Also, Dumbledore knows that assigning important responsibility to someone encourages them to rise to the occasion. He probably has good reason to trust Monungus and is hopeful he can fulfill this mission and, as a denizen of the underworld, contribute to the Order in ways others can't. Secondly, there is only a small chance Harry will be in danger on any given day on Privet Drive. He doesn't really need constant protection so much as a lookout to call for help if needed, and Mundungus should have been capable of this. That he failed and left Harry defenseless was not inevitable. Mundungus could have been quite valuable to the Order if he had made different choices. Unfortunately, Mundungus didn't rise to the occasion, and even worse, it appears Dumbledore didn't learn from this experience and continued to trust Mundungus to dire consequences later. But this first assignment was a good opportunity to prove him. Thanks for the consistently great podcast. All right. Well, I guess I can get behind that. But as if, as Jeff points out, Mundungus ends up being a flop and Dumbledore still trusted him. And I think that's where some of our r- frustration came from. It's like, how didn't Dumbledore see this coming? Yeah. I mean, to be fair, Dumbledore trusts Hagrid and Hagrid screws up multiple times over the Whoa. course of the series. Whoa. But Hagrid is nice. Yeah, but the thing is, we like Hagrid, so we forgive him. (laughs) We don't like Mundungus, so we, you know. I guess maybe maybe the thought is that with, you know, how shady Mundungus is, maybe he would hear chatter from the dark side and be able to let them know ahead of time if maybe there's a plan underway. But other than that, yeah, I question that decision, too. Yeah, I mean, at least last week in our discussion, I think we were very ba- much basing it on Mundungus' actions. We weren't saying, oh, he's a smuggler criminal, so we should hate him because he's a smuggler criminal. We were saying, here's a smuggler criminal that completely left Harry very vulnerable in a time of need. Okay, that's accurate. What about Dobby? Where was he? <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, presumably Harry can just call his name and... He'll show up at any time. I'll be there. Well, wouldn't he have been a better person to post than Mundungus? That's actually a good question. Yeah, because Dobby doesn't answer to anyone anymore. So it's not like he can be forced to hand over information. Hmm. Come on, Dumbledore. <laughs> but where's Dobby going to? I guess he could just sit invisibly somewhere. That would freak the the Dursleys out and the other neighbors on the street if they saw that house elf around more than mundungus even though he uh looks pretty creepy. now that we think about it dobby has probably a good working of uh privet drive because he probably spent most of the summer there yeah blocking harry's letters in book two right and nobody ever saw him at that point so mm. i presume he's able to at least keep himself hidden in some way in bushes yeah yeah but then with his loyalty to Harry, wouldn't it have been really hard for him to not get in the way if he sees Harry being mistreated? Oh, that's yeah, that's a good point. And he would want to talk to Harry really bad, so he'd start beating himself up with a lamp. <laughs> well, if you want something foreign to your daily routine, we have a new sponsor this week I think you will like. You're super! They are on a mission to improve people's health with the power of super plants. Your Super's functional superfood and plant protein mixes are made from naturally dried organic whole foods, nothing else. In other words, superfoods are fruits, vegetables, seeds, grasses, leaves that are extremely high in a variety of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, enzymes, and healthy fats. These nutrients are all essential for your health and well-being. In fact, Your Super was started when one of the co-founders, Michael, was diagnosed with cancer. His wife, Crystal, started making superfood mixes to help him rebuild his immune system. And when they saw the impact superfood mixes had made in improving Michael's health, they decided to share these formulas with the world. These, of course, are for everyone who just wants to feel healthier and have more energy during the day. I picked the chocolate lover protein. I can add it daily to my breakfast. It is a delicious yet super healthy way to start the day. I feel good about it, unlike when I eat ice cream. Get the cleanest superfood and plant protein mixes at YourSuper.com. That's Y-O-U-R Super.com. If you're looking to change up your diet with something that's genuinely good for you, give these a try. 
Get 15% off your order when you use code MuggleCast at checkout. Just go to YourSuper.com. And don't forget to get 15% off with promo code MuggleCast at checkout. It's important to use that code because they'll know we sent you. Thank you, Your Super, for sponsoring us. All right, time now for Chapter by Chapter, Chapter 3, Order of the Phoenix, The Advance Guard. And let's start with our seven-word summary. Tonight. Tonight. The. Guard. Rides. <laughs> into. We got this, guys. Grimald. <laughs> <laughs> place Woo! tonight the guard rides into grimwald place i thought it was going toward tonight the guard rides into the dark <laughs> <laughs> into the night sky. sky yeah yeah all right that was an easy one yeah okay so this chapter coming off of the first two chapters were really 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 heavy uh, lots of stuff about the Dursleys and their treatment of Harry and this, that, the other thing. This is the chapter where Harry finally escapes. But it kind of starts off in a place of uh, some anger. And the opening of the chapter sees Harry scribbling a letter furiously three times. He sends it to Hermione, to Ron, and to Sirius. And his letter says, I've just been attacked by Dementors. And I might be expelled from Hogwarts. I want to know what's going on and when I'm going to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And he, the thing about this, so I don't think there's anything unreasonable about his request because everything that he says that happened to him did just happen to him. But he waits for Hedwig to return from a hunt. She returns. She doesn't even get to eat her frog or whatever. And he <laughs> straps these letters to her and tells her to peck at... Uh, each of his friends' fingertips until they've written substantially, satisfyingly, substantially long letters in reply. So he's not going to sit for any other vague kind of just quick-witted, oh, can't talk, we'll do more later kind of thing. He's actually instructing Hedwig to attack his friends, and I think this is like a new low. Harry. he's also really mean to hedwig yeah like she flies in and he's like put that down i've got work for you like <laughs> and whoa. he instantly feels bad about that but that's the place that he's in he has to lash out at even the animals the adorable never done anything wrong animals though i'm also just thinking eric while you were describing that karma's a bitch because he's about to get his hand torn up by Umbridge later in the book. Oh, man. So Good that's what he point. gets Whoa. for wishing danger on his friend's hands. Yeah. It just, it, it is actually a good indicator of where Harry's head is going to be for most of this book. He is so desperate. He's been driven to the point of desperation that he's actively causing harm to his friends. I think you see, correct me if I'm wrong, like, Laura, do you remember, like, we see their fingers are, like, bandaged later. Yes. Yeah, he definitely sees the evidence of Hedwig's pecking. And she's just being a loyal bird, you know? She's just like, okay, okay I'll, I'll go do this. I'll defend Harry here, though. I, I don't see much wrong with what he's asking Hedwig to do. He he wants a response. And and he can't just, you know, put some neosporin on the pecs or what, you know, I mean, <laughs> or use some magic to make it feel better. Or, yeah, I mean, come on, they have things for this. Yeah, so let's. It, it's no, true. I, it's not fair to ask Hedwig to do that, though. I I don't think she probably enjoyed doing it, but I don't blame Harry. He's been cooped up in the house all summer. He's not getting any answers from anybody. He's being told what to do. He's not hearing from his friends. It's it, this is all he has left to try. Yeah, I, I'll agree with you there. It's important to point out that these are just flesh wounds that can be remedied by most modern magic. But my whole thing is. Harry is putting the blame on the wrong people. So the the fact that Hermione and Ron are, are, aren't are saying anything useful to him by his estimation is to do with not only the state that the ministry is in watching every letter, but also Dumbledore's orders. They're just following Dumbledore. And so he's causing physical harm to Hermione and Ron, but it's really Dumbledore he should be angry at. Yeah. Um, Harry also debates the source of the Howler very briefly, but I was also wondering, and we didn't really get at this much in our last chapter discussion, how many options are there in terms of who sent that Howler? 
Isn't it's Dumbledore good. the one obvious choice? Well, I think the issue is he doesn't recognize the voice. Yeah. Dumbledore's using his angry voice. <laughs> <laughs> Remember my last. <laughs> For me, the confusion always ends up with the word choice. Remember my last, last what? I don't understand the use of the English language like that. But as we've learned today, I don't understand a lot of the English <laughs> language. <laughs> but that was the genius of it. I think somebody wrote in about that. that that's the genius of it. It's, it's mysterious. Yeah. You do have to think about it. Right, and Petunia gets it. If it got too it. specific, it would be boring. Yeah, Petunia gets it, which is definitely the, the whole point. Um, right. She knows who it is. I, do you have to yell when you record your howler? Does it just put a filter on your voice to make it sound like you're yelling? Oh. Everybody's yelling. Huh. I think it magnifies the voice automatically. <laughs> yeah, there's no I, way I Dumbledore... Feel like, I feel like huh? there would be some catharsis in recording your howler when you're yelling because you don't get the satisfaction of yelling at the person. Yeah. So you get it out in that moment. And you're like, ah, oh, okay, I'm done. That's so f But would Dumbledore yell? I don't think he would. Well, would you whisper into a howl into your, if you're sending somebody a howler that they have to open or it explodes and reveals the contents of the message. Would you really whisper something? Like I'm thinking of Molly Weasley when she chastises Ron for the flying car and her like right. Arthur's nearly lost his job. Would she be like, you know, saying what she says in a calm manner? Heck no. She would absolutely be screaming it. In that case, no. But Dumbledore sitting in his office. Remember my last. I think I think that's how he would say it. And then the howler howler eyes is it. Remember my last. Yeah. Bah. I don't know. This does. It is really interesting because people love calling out Michael Gambon for his performance in Goblet of Fire. <laughs> yeah. He's like, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? And then in the book, it's like that line's like, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Said Dumbledore calmly. You know, it's right. like, OK, maybe there is canon evidence to suggest that Dumbledore does yell sometimes. <laughs> Mm, maybe. So, uh, Petunia gets the howler. Wanted to mention Petunia here real quickly. There's basically a three or four day period now because Harry sends H Hedwig off at the beginning of the chapter. Three days go by with nothing. Now, it's an interesting time jump. We're, of course, getting to, like, the events where Harry's about to be rescued. But during that time... I might have expected that the relationship between Petunia and Harry would change. We had that big, huge moment in chapter two where Petunia says, no, the boy stays. She described that she knows Dementors and Harry felt some kind of a kinship to her. But over the course of these three days, Harry doesn't leave his room except to go to the bathroom and Petunia brings food and she puts it through the cat flap. That has been there since book two when Vernon installed it. And so there's no heart to heart. There's no follow up between the two of them. Did anybody else think that this was missing or unfortunate? She's going to do her best to stay away from Harry at this point. I think we need to remember who she's married to and sort of the pretense that she's trying to uphold the, the, the persona that she's trying to put out there. And I think, we got what we're going to get from her in this book. We obviously learn more later on in the series, but I'm not surprised. And and I would think she would almost want to stay away from Harry because I would assume that he would have a lot more questions. But I wanted to touch on the part that you brought up about feeding him through a cat flap. Yeah. And I just thought, given our conversations in the first two chapters, this just speaks further to the child abuse that Harry is enduring, the fact that he's being fed through a hole in the door. And even later, when they're going out to the award show that they're, you know, when, when they're getting the best kept lawn award, Vernon tells Harry not to steal from the fridge. Like, <laughs> steal. He uses the word steal. <laughs> so th the treatment that Harry is receiving here, again, it's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah, you're right. I also don't totally understand why they're using the cat flap because Harry can still go to use the bathroom. He says that. <laughs> He says he can use the bathroom. So it's not like he's locked in unless he's asking for the door to be temporarily unlocked. Um, but I guess it just speaks to how Petunia can't even physically face him right now. So he just drops the, f she just drops the food through that little 
cap door. Yeah, I, and I, I wonder, though, if it's Dumbledore's letter has re-solidified her barrier being up. Like, I wonder if anything in that letter... Probably. Like, Sit told her not to tell Harry anything. Like, I wonder if Dumbledore's letter served the purpose of keeping more secrets from Harry. Like, at the same time that it... Well, made... she's kind of been exposed, so she probably feels ashamed right now. And these old feelings about her relationship with Dumbledore, just, you know, not not a very serious relationship, just her, her interest in becoming a witch, um, have been brought to the surface, those feelings. So I I don't think she probably acts weird around Vernon right now as well, because, you know, Vernon's wondering, you know, Dudley's wondering. It's probably a rough time for her. Yeah, it's, that's a good point. That's a character analysis I was hoping for. So. The other thing that is kind of left uh, by the wayside after chapter two is Dudley's uh, physical, mental, emotional state. We don't know how his recovery is going following the Dementors. And it was he was very violently ill last chapter. But because Harry's in his room for several days and then all the Dursleys leave together, like presumably by the end of day three or four, Dudley is able to go to this lawn competition thing. That they're that they're going off to uh that's a big ruse but we don't actually know what the process is like and i just feel like maybe harry shouldn't necessarily care about dudley but i would like to to have known because he's not doing anything he's just up in his room i'd like to know how dudley's recovery went like what what that looked like i have a feeling the dursleys wouldn't want harry to know about that and they would be trying to shield dudley from him as much as possible mm. um which is probably the reason that harry's been locked away in his room right to limit the exposure that he has to his cousin um and i just think that because they probably don't want their neighbors to know they care so much about what everybody thinks of them they probably don't want people to see dudley going through any kind of recovery and make anybody ask questions yeah you know uh, it's just, you know, there is sort of a switch that turns on uh, here in this chapter, and it becomes completely OK to laugh at the Dursleys again, um, is what I wrote, because because the, the whole best kept lawn thing <laughs> is hilarious. Um, but it's very much a, a tonal shift from, you, you know, Harry may have caused his cousin irreparable physical and emotional harm in the previous chapter. So. It's like something sweet. Well, Harry didn't. Well, Harry, by way of being magic and attracting magic, um, mm. you know. Well, that's the thing. The interaction between Dudley and the Dementors, how do we know that it's, you know, we just assume that what he saw from his experience is what changed his attitude between now and the end of the series. What if it was actually some kind of a health effect? We don't know. We don't know how Dementors actually affect a muggle. Well, yeah, it could have been. And I wouldn't even be sure that the Dursleys are being very helpful in helping Dudley recover. I mean, they seem to like to keep their head in the sand when it comes into their comes to their son's well-being. Right. I could very much see Vernon telling Dudley to just like get it together yeah, and, man up. you know, stop stop being a pansy and like all this other man crap. Up. Give him yeah, the exactly. old one, too. Oh, you'll get over it. You don't need a therapist. You don't need any sort of psychiatrist you don't need to talk to anybody hmm. it's just another way to further ignore the fact that magic does exist and you have a wizard living in your house yeah mm -hmm. for sure so as micah mentioned uh vernon does come into harry's room he says we're leaving he says fine don't steal any food from the fridge harry says fine and shortly thereafter Harry hears a crash downstairs and voices. And this is kind of the moment that I think we've been yearning for as readers since the beginning of the chapter. Harry feels so alone, but then all of a sudden he looks down from the top of the stairs and sees Mad-Eye Moody, Remus Lupin, and a bunch of witches and wizards. Nine people, nine people from his world are finally here to rescue him. And immediately things are looking up. Yeah, and I found it odd that the first person Harry has to see is Mad-Eye because, you know, he was Barty Crouch Jr. <laughs> last year. And the, Harry probably still has PTSD over this. And the first person he has to see is Mad-Eye. It doesn't seem like they thought that through. Uh, 
lead with Lupin. Enter and yell, hey, Harry, are you here? <laughs> oh my gosh, Lupin, everything's cool, nothing to worry about. But no, it's Mad-Eye, the guy who was not who he really was last book. That's a good point. J.K. Rowling had like an interesting and unique challenge in this book to write this same character that she'd written last year, as, but like as a completely different person. Um, but I think that she did well enough in the beginning of Goblet of Fire when he was like days from retirement to like show kind of what his character was. And she immediately leans really heavily on comedy to convey that this Mad-Eye Moody is like a good time guy and he's super cool and ca is, is capable of self-deprecation. And the greatest thing that I think of about Moody in this chapter is he really seems to own what happened to him. And he's moving past it. Like when he's talking about his magical eye that's sticky ever since that imposter wore it, like, and asks Harry for a glass from the dishwasher. Um, it just is very uh, sort of gruff in the way you'd expect from a warrior wizard, but comedic and like I said, like he just acknowledges the past and that's the only way to move on from great trauma like Mad-Eye has suffered and like Harry has suffered is to really acknowledge the journey. I like how Mad-Eye cleans his eye like beer pong players clean their ping pong balls. <laughs> just throw it in the cup, swish it around a little bit. It'll be fine. <laughs> there won't be hair in your beer the next time it lands in a cup. <laughs> You know, it's Ugh. funny. We never find out what happens to that glass of water afterwards. Yeah, it's just sitting on the dining room table. <laughs> you know, Petunia would put that in the dishwasher. Immediately, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this foreign glass. But that's assuming Dudley didn't rush inside and... Dehydrated you know, from his or, recent Dementor attack. Or okay. want a snack or something. Let's be real. Dudley Dursley does not drink water. <laughs> this, this is a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so um now the chapter doesn't have too much going on it but we do uh well it will in a moment when we get to tonks but i wanted to do a run through of the advance guard because these are people who in some ways have their neck on the line for harry some of them he's actually met before and others he hasn't so i wanted to run through the list kind of talk about who's here because it does get lost in the shuffle but first of all the most familiar face in the crowd remus lupin uh it's so great after the drought of remus lupin in book four to have him here be be front and center in the rescue party for harry do you guys like seeing lupin yeah and harry's desperate for his communication from dumbledore or his friends and this is probably the best person who who could come out besides ron and hermione so seeing him so quickly must have been a huge relief yeah agreed yeah but i think as readers it also makes us wonder what he's been through because harry notes that he looks older and even you know patchier than ever <laughs> you know the funny thing about that is i'm pretty sure this is the start of it but J.K. Rowling really fell into, I think it's a bad habit of describing Lupin that exact same way every time <laughs> that, he's, that she sees him. It's definitely in book six. But in book five, I really want to track this because we're going through. But every time Lupin shows up, there's something about either gray or hair, uh, tattered ear clothing, or like just looking haggard and 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 more tired than ever before. It's just the, it gets to the point where by book seven you expect Remus Lupin to be walking around naked. Like it's just there's no more clothes. They've just all just fallen off of his bones. Like it's nuts. Lupin well, is crawling. I I think that it's intended to imply that his condition is taking a toll on him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. It's just funny because I think she might be guilty of overusing it um but it's important obviously to set the scene for like where lupin's because we haven't seen him for a year it's important for there to be like noted differences like mm -hmm. this so hey, maybe I, you just catch him every night or every day after a full moon or something and that's why yeah he looks the way he does i mean but i agree with laura i i, I think it's more to just show the toll that his condition is taking on him. Probably what Dumbledore has tasked him with as well is extremely emotionally and physically draining. You know, this sort of underground um, task that he's on. I don't know if we've learned about that later on in this book or later on in the series. I forget, but you know, he's he's going through some rough times. Could it maybe be intentional, just a little bit, or at least in terms of his clothing, if he's trying to, you know work on the secret mission maybe he doesn't want to look like the 
cleanest and most, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a great Camped point. Person, I yeah. think that's fair. Yeah. So, uh, just moving on, there. The only person that I think Harry has met before, besides Mad Eye and Remus, is Daedalus Diggle. This is a guy that once bowed to Harry in a shop before Harry knew he was a wizard. He also met him, I think, at the Leaky Cauldron in his first year. And uh, sure enough, Daedalus Diggle is here as a, a member of the Order of the Phoenix and the Advanced Guard. And I think this is really special because Daedalus Diggle is clearly a Harry Potter fanboy. Yeah, he is. Very much so. Yeah, what I find so interesting about this is that Remus kind of makes this remark to Harry at one point uh, of saying, it was a surprising number of people volunteered to come get you. <laughs> and we're led to believe that it's because most of these people just want to lay their eyes on the Harry Potter. And I'm like, that's great. But where were y'all when they needed people to watch him? <laughs> <laughs> that's a boring job. That's why. <laughs> yeah, that that is a good question. Were any of these people in the watch that was that Mundungus was a part of that were keeping and I. This is exciting. It's a little adventure, a little night out on the town, plus flying over London. It'd be exciting. Yeah, the only thing that I think of when I think of Daedalus Diggle is, though, is in book one, McGonagall kind of throws some shade. He got he actually, so Daedalus Diggle, in addition to Sirius Black, gets a mention in book one, chapter one. And it's when McGonagall says that he was probably the one who was shooting stars, breaking the statute of secrecy um, up in Kent. And she says, bet it was Daedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. So I think that McGonagall probably thinks that Daedalus Diggle's a little lightheaded, a little, little kind of, I don't know, impulsive, maybe. Probably not the best fit for your Harry Watch guard. Fortunately, it never comes to a head that he is anything other than delightful. Um, he, of course, in Deathly Hallows, as a reminder to people, uh, is one of the people who comes back to Privet Drive to usher the Dursleys to safety, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, another member of the Advance Guard is Hestia Jones, and she is also seen again in Deathly Hallows when she comes to escort the Dursleys to safety. So I liked that more than one person that we meet in the Advance Guard are there. Well, they're here protecting Harry, but eventually they're protecting the Dursleys. And in Book 7, things are so much more serious for the Dursleys. So it's important to have good witches and wizards guiding them, you know, out, basically. Um and then the only other thing I had about Hestia Jones is she finds a potato peeler very funny. She is like laughing at it when Harry comes downstairs. So that's pretty funny. But um, there's a couple people who will become very important very shortly from now, namely uh, Sturgis Podmore. This is a guy who uh, works in the ministry. He is actually on guard duty in a couple weeks from now, and he's guarding, I think, the Hall of Prophecy. But he's going to be dragged across the Daily Prophet in a couple weeks when he's apprehended um, by apparently like a Voldemort ministry. The HP Wiki said it was Lucius Malfoy, actually, who tried to imperious him to go into the Hall of Prophecy and steal a prophecy. I'm sure we're going to read about this in a couple chapters, but Sturgis Podmore is like, the, you know, he's a good guy who we're about to see kind of get dragged for for the cause for Harry. Um so that's really interesting. And uh, Emily and Vance, Mike, do you want to take uh, just what I wrote on her? Sure. So uh, one other member that shows up is Emily and Vance. And we learn that her death actually occurs nearby the Muggle Prime Minister's office. And it's mentioned several times early on in Half-Blood Prince. And even more so, her loss is understood to be a really critical blow uh, to the Order of the Phoenix. and. Uh, yeah, I'm just really impressed overall by the quality of people that are sent to get Harry just from an experience standpoint. I mean, Kingsley Shacklebolt, future minister of magic and and is there. I mean, and and I know this is really the first time Harry and him interact with each other. I also really liked the interaction that took place between Kingsley and Lupin, uh how they were just talking with each other. That's a lot of that just gets lost in the movie and, and, you know, they seem to be relatively close and, and know each other relatively well. And Kingsley actually knows James and, and, and Lily. And, and that's something again, that I don't think comes across as much, 
uh, in in the movies. Yeah, honestly, a lot of these characters, I think Kingsley and Tonks are both really good examples of characters that I don't think were done justice in the movies. Absolutely. Um, and especially, I mean, we're going to get into Tonks in a moment, but I will say that after rereading this, I found myself disappointed in the way that she was uh, presented in the movies. No, no shade towards it's Natalia Tena, right? Who yeah. plays her. She's great. It's just the writing was not there. Unfortunately. Yeah. We kind of see her be like a, a kid best friend to, to Harry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's very, very, very impulsive and clumsy and, and cute and funny. Uh, in and a she's the youngest one there. Yeah, and that sets her apart from everybody else. So I'm glad we got to talking about Tonks. We actually, so she goes upstairs in just a moment to help him with his trunk. But Harry, uh, being immersed in all of these people who are wizards, asks them for answers. And this is, a, I think, a, a pretty big turning point, at least for the moment. Uh, the quote from the book is, Oh yeah, said Harry, look... What's going on? I haven't heard anything from anyone. What's Vol? And then he gets cut off. It says several of the witches and wizards made odd hissing noises. Daedalus Diggle dropped his hat again and Moody growled. Shut up. What? said Harry. We're not discussing anything here. It's too risky, said Moody. So unfortunately, Harry is still not getting any answers from anybody. Yeah. But well, what's so risky, though? I mean, isn't that a, it's a safe house, essentially, that they're in? Yeah protected by one of the strongest charms there is so what's the danger but these people are also the type of people who don't like saying voldemort out loud right so it might have to do with that as well oh that's actually a really good point but it's probably a combination of both things i would think laura you had a really interesting question here that i actually laughed at which question at least i think it's yours the co-workers one? Oh, that's me oh like i just tried to imagine what it would be like for this group of adult wizards who are they're sure they're all in the order together but they sh they traveled cross country in a huge group there's all this secrecy moody's every step of the way going this is important this is too risky we can't take risks and then they're going to get this 15 year old like moody teenager from an empty house in suburban england like what is that can you just imagine i know we all have like friends from work or groups of friends that are like eight people. Just imagine you and your best friends, mid 30 somethings, going and picking up this 15 year old teenager, like in a random one, too, just like nobody you've ever met before. What would that be like? I just think it's kind of funny and surre surreal to kind of think of what must be going through the order's head at this moment, or the advance guard's head at this moment. But, you know, it's not just any 15 year old boy. So I think they find a lot of purpose in it. Yeah. I think they, they see that it is a good use of their time and it won't take up too much time. And it's Harry freaking Potter. These people are obsessed with him. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good point, though, because, Micah, you're, I knew you're pretty familiar with this. Um, traveling with people you work with is a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, guys, it's like two hours. Yeah, yeah. This isn't some, like, no, but it's trip across the country. No, no, no. But ha did you ever like, for instance, Andrew, when you were in school, like go on an overnight field trip with yeah. people you went to school with? And it's like you're taking people that you normally only see in one environment mm. and you're all in a different place. It is it is strange. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you guys we, are we, just bad at socializing with other people. This is no problem for me. I can adapt to wherever I am. That is crap. <laughs> <laughs> It it definitely see when I was in high school, um, I went on several trips with I was in chorus and we did several trips, uh, two to New York, one to Orlando for a competition. And you definitely get to know your friends um, differently and not always for the best. So, you know, once you get out of high school or they graduate, you don't necessarily keep talking afterwards. So. I could just imagine how weird it would be with coworkers. Yeah. And the reason I ask this, there's these little things like Sturgis Podmore and Kingsley Shacklebolt. They probably don't work like really closely together, but they bond over the microwave in, in Privet Drive. 
They're just like, look at this piece of technology and they're so, talking about it. I'm like, what would they have to say to one another about it? You know, do, do you guys think that this little trip was good or bad for Tonks and Ru- Lupin's relationship? Oh, it's too soon for that. <laughs> but probably bad, right? Because she chastises him for using her first name. Mm-hmm. She's like, no, dude, I go by Tonks. Yeah. Yeah crazy mother so yeah let's let's get to tonks so tonks is awesome this has been the coverage of tonks in this chapter um (laughs) she's visibly the youngest member she has problems with authority she hates her name tonks is the punk teenage goth that we all wanted to be (laughs) i think right i mean but she's successful at it too is the thing she's got just enough talent that even in the, the beginning of this chapter, when we first meet her, she proves why she's along on this mission. And I don't know, like, even though Harry's not getting the answers he wants, Tonks's presence there, I think, calms him in like a very understated, but like huge way. Yeah, well, I think she's easier to relate to for him than anybody else, because one, she's really not that much older than him. And two, she's an auror, and that kind of takes his mind off of everything that's going on and allows him to be laser focused on asking her questions about that, because that's the only career path he's ever had in mind. Yeah. And it was furthermore, it was her brilliant idea to send a letter, muggle post to the Dursleys saying they've won the all England best kept suburban lawn competition the, because I, she's familiar with muggles. She says her dad was muggle born Ted Tongs. Um, But it's her idea to send that letter that gets the Dursleys out of the house. So it's her plan that they are all enacting right now. And I think that that makes Tonks especially badass. Yeah. How could the Dursleys be so stupid to think that their lawn was actually nominated for this though? I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> In the middle of a drought season, too. Nobody's lawn is winning any awards until the rain comes back. And what is the, are the judges driving around all of England to find the best kept lawns? And there just happens to win. They all look the same. This just speaks to how desperate the Dursleys are for anything special to happen to them. And their lives are so boring that they get excited for this and they dress up Mm -hmm. and they're, they're going out. What yeah. losers? <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. It's just another reason for them to, assuming it was real, for them to be able to hold it over their neighbors, stick their noses in the air, and act like they're better than everyone else. True. So of course they're going to believe what do you, it. What do you get? Is it a trophy? Is it a certificate? Is it like a golden lawnmower? Like, can you put I it was out? Say, <laughs> I think they get a special set of lawn gnomes. Oh man. Yep. Ah, uh, beautiful. I was going to suggest golden shears, but I like the lawnmower better. But yeah, it's s- something chintzy like that. But this is what I'm saying. Like coming off of last chapter, this is a stark contrast. It's all of a sudden totally cool to laugh at the Dursleys again. Right? Like it's, oh, the Dursleys. Of course, they'd be fooled by this. Ha 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 ha. And move on without any kind of consequences as to the events at the beginning of the chapter had on their family. Um, So just interesting. But You know, perhaps the most interesting thing about Tonks from a standpoint of setting her aside from others is that she is a metamorphagist uh, and she can change her appearance at will. We see her doing this. She asks Harry to comment on the color of her hair and he's like, what? Uh, And she changes it. But this ability apparently. So this is a new branch of magic we've never heard about before in any of the other Harry Potter books. Apparently she's born with it. So she can't really, he asks her, to your point, Laura, like, he's distracted successfully, so he's asking her questions. And apparently, uh, you can't really learn this, but other wizards who are also aurors, some of the categories that they have to go through are concealment, detection, these other things. They have to use potions and transfiguration and spells to, like, do what she can just do naturally i'm really jealous i would save so much money (laughs) on my hair if i could just turn it whatever color i wanted at will you have like gorgeous blue hair right now thank you Um, it was green moments ago wasn't it are you a metamorph magic i wish recently it was green though right it was yeah that's cool Mm -hmm. that's super cool uh yeah so there's some obvious uh conveniences that we would change like hair dyeing 
I've also done that a lot this past year. But then there's other practical conveniences, like Tonk says to Harry, I bet you'd like hiding that scar, wouldn't you? And this is obviously very important to Harry as a, as a person. It is. But I'm also thinking, and we discussed this recently in one of our Swisher Stone episodes, because Harry brings up his scar and whether or not he should have it. Or we discuss his thoughts on having the scar visible. But I'm just like, why not throw some makeup on it? If you really want to hide it, give it a try. We all have blemishes. And sometimes we throw a little makeup on. I do all the time. If I had a scar and I didn't want people to know who I was, I would throw some makeup on it for a day. And maybe he'll realize, oh, I actually kind of like this attention. I'll, let me just rub the makeup off. No problem. That's a good point that he is never, Harry never at Hogwarts, like, for instance, has, like, tried to research how to conceal his scar. He's just kind of being himself, I guess. And there's got to be a spell for well, hiding it. And right? the thing that's interesting about this is that before Harry finds out that he's a wizard in book one, he remarks that the only part of his appearance that he really likes is the cool lightning bolt shaped scar on his forehead. So there right. is a there is a point where he has an affinity for that, but then it becomes something that sort of um, makes it difficult for him to have any privacy. Yeah, it starts tingling, it gets uncomfortable and all that kind of stuff, so... I definitely agree. But I, I did have an idea. What? So we kind of touched on it already, but what would each of us do? We'll start with Christina. What would you do if you were a metamorphomagist? If you could change like your face and stuff at will to blend in or, or whatever, how would you use it? I would totally use it on my hair. Yeah, I'd love to change my hair color. I've never dyed it. But at the same time, if you can change the length of your hair, yeah, it's it's a little dorky, but I would get it as long as possible and then get it cut and donate it because that's already something i do and it makes me feel good so that's awesome oh, why not oh man i thought you were like gonna like rapunzel it and be like i'm gonna get it as long as possible and then like jump out castle towers <laughs> i was like i did not jump out of a castle tower but i did get it as long as possible once i think it was like 11 years without cutting it and Whoa. then when i was 15 i just got tired of it yeah Unbelievable. That's super awesome. So a metamorphosis can transform into any human, but we never learn if they can transform into an animal. If they could, I would definitely want to transform into a bird so I could fly around. Well, I think the difference between metamorphosis and animagus is that animagus obviously transform into an animal, but metamorphosis can take on like, I, I understood it to not be like a full transformation, Tonks herself does give herself like a pig nose at some point um, to make Ginny laugh. I think it is later in the book. But um, yeah, like she can do, she could probably do like an animal face, like a turn her face into like a horse's or something. Yeah. In the movie, she turns into, is it like a duck face? It looks like. Oh, yeah, yeah. The bill. Yeah. 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 So I don't, I, so yeah, I would like to be. I guess I, it would just be kind of cool to be somebody else for a day just to see what their life is like. Then I don't know what you would do with that actual person. I, <laughs> I guess you would have to hide them like uh, Barty did Moody. But mm. yeah, it'd be, it, this would be a cool skill to have. Yeah. For me, I would try and get really good at celebrity impersonations. Uh, and metamorphosis would just help me do that. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd do like a, a good George Clooney or a good Tom Hanks or a good Bruce Willis or something, you know, just by uh, metamorphosizing myself <laughs> into them. So that's what probably what I would use it for is like a stand up routine. How about you, Micah? I'd go for a, a full beard. I can't really do it. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> Despite what I looked like earlier in our Patreon hangout. Andrew, you look like it's improved, right? For you, I don't. I feel like all th three of of the male hosts here have what's improved your ability to grow a beard. Yeah, it's true. Oh, I just haven't shaved in a few days. That's my problem. No, but like we we can't really no. do it, right? I, can't I mean, I could, but it would just be patchy. So yeah, same. That's a good point. This section of the show brought to you by Harry's razors. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. Moving on here. That was fun. Uh, moving on, we do get a mention of uh, Andromeda, Tonks' mother. And this will come up in a couple chapters when we're doing the Black Family Tree. But Andromeda Black is actually the most badass 
uh, character that J.K. Rowling has ever written, as far as I'm concerned, mostly because she sticks it to her sisters, Narcissa and Bellatrix, about being evil and goes off and marries a muggle. But it's an interesting uh, kind of insight into who Andromeda is as a person because we're meeting her daughter. So Tonks obviously has a problem with her name. She uh, says uh, you would hate your fir first name, too, if your fool of a mother had called you Nymphadora. And also she kind of praises her mother's uh, domestic spell work because when she's cleaning up Harry's trunk, she says, my mom's got this knack of getting stuff to fit itself in neatly. She even gets the socks to fold themselves, but I've never mastered how she does it. It's a kind of a flick. And then she, I would like that. Yeah. Right. Like it would just be like, I like being super organized. cool, but it's interesting to learn that magic can be that specific. Like, how does a sock know that it belongs as part of a pair to another sock and knows that it belongs on top of the robes, the books? You know, how does everything sort itself in? Well, it's magic, but it's intentional magic. And I think there are wizards and witches. We don't see this area of spell work a lot, but there's people who are like really, really good at like moving around these things that have different properties and even just something as simple as packing them away in a trunk. I think it's really cool magic to witness. You guys agree? Sure. I'd love to be able to do that to just put up my clean laundry every week. Mm -hmm. I hate cleaning. So this yeah. would be great. <laughs> um, so then uh, Tox and Harry have the conversation. She uh, uses a transportation charm. She says locomotor trunk to carry his trunk downstairs. Here's a question. No. Um, <laughs> why doesn't Tonks, using this spell, set off the charm, the watch, the trace that is in Harry's house? Because she's, she's doing the spell. That's why. And adults are allowed to use but magic. They just can't be seen, whereas kids can't use it at all. But the according to the books, the magic, the ministry, doesn't know... Who casts a spell in a muggle residence? This is how Harry gets busted in book two, is the ministry didn't know that it was Dobby the house elf that caused a hover charm to drop the cake on the on the uh, Mason's head. So Harry got busted in chapter two, or in book two. Now Harry is on trial for using magic in a muggle area in front of a muggle. So why doesn't this spell... Or any of the spells that the Order's doing really send an alert. I would think that the, the, the trouble in this is the advance guard would have to not use magic. That would be why they have to go on brooms. That would be why they can't just apparate out of here. Like, my whole thing is this should have been about the trace. I was wondering if... I had two thoughts here. One, I feel like Dobby's magic would register differently with the Ministry. Because we know that the Ministry already doesn't regard non-wizards the same way that they regard wizards like even squibs like they don't have it in their registry that mrs fig lives on privet drive because they don't keep track of squibs because is that canon like what's the reference for that that's been mentioned a couple times but i forget reading about that. i think that it was actually in the trial um, where they say we don't have a record of oh got it a, a witch or wizard living on Privet Drive and she's <laughs> like well you wouldn't because I'm a squip right okay um, got you so I'm wondering if Dobby's magic would register differently than an adult wizard's magic would and the other thing is that the Dursleys aren't there right now so there's technically not any risk of a Muggle seeing magic being performed because they're inside the home right i do agree i i would like to know how this works exactly but i feel like those are kind of the two loopholes we can work with here yeah i would add a third which is that tonks is an or so mm. why would you need to question her use of a spell Ooh. so they have like aurors have like some kind of extra protection about performing magic in front of muggles and but she's not performing it in front of any muggles yeah but she's in a muggle dwelling but yeah she is of age too so i don't know maybe there's something to it i just thought because harry doesn't cast the spell in book two and gets in trouble for it and i'm sure that's part of dobby's design as well to keep him from going to hogwarts that dobby makes the spell seem like it came from harry or something like that 
Yeah, but why are you just focusing on locomotor trunk? I mean, she uses other spells before that. Yeah, the, the she cleans spell. up Hedwig's cage. That's what I'm she saying. She puts all the stuff in the trunk. Yeah, there's all these spells. Locomotor trunk was just the most recent one. Like, why? Because because ultimately, her and Harry could take one side of his trunk and just carry it down. This is the but point. But it's not. It's, yeah, it's not to me. Like what it comes down to is not underage magic. Mm. This is not Tonks is not underage, so. Right. That that's why it's not an issue. But a spell is being cast in Privet Drive, just like it was in Book Two, that Harry got in trouble for using magic in front of Muggles when he didn't do it. The Trace can't tell it was him. Why do you want Harry to get in trouble again? Why can't you just be happy for I'm, Harry? That's what I'm saying. Give him a so break. I'm, right, I'm, but to Laura's point, it was done by a house elf, and maybe the Ministry can't tell the difference between a house elf and Harry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. They're roughly the same size in book two, right? We're going in circles now. So Yeah, I think we have sufficiently covered this. Um, but, you know, if listeners think that it's a problem or not an issue, fine, right in. That's cool. Um, so moving on, Harry goes downstairs, and this is when Moody puts a disillusionment charm on him. Here's the thing. They rule out apparition. They say, you're too young to apparate. But we know that this is not strictly true as of book six. Now, Harry leaves Privet Drive in book six with Sight Along Apparition. He just holds Dumbledore's hand and they do it. Um, Sight Along Apparition in book six is talked about. I think the Weasleys talk about doing it with their mom and pop when they needed to get places. You can Sight Along Apparate a child or somebody that's younger than 15. So Really, is it this just a case of J.K. Rowling not having invented side along apparition yet? I think maybe. She also kind of backs herself into a corner with the invisibility cloak versus the disillusionment charm because she couldn't give everybody um, invisibility cloaks because then that would make Harry's less special. So what can she do to make them all invisible? <laughs> well, I'll make them like half invisible where you can still see them, but they're transparent. So they're like kind of invisible. So I have a question here. Um, I'm confused by this moment and also the moment in book seven when they're all taking off from the Dursley's garden on broomsticks. They clearly take measures like disillusioning Harry to make it so nobody can see him. But is it really reasonable to assume that nine people could take off from a muggle garden on broomsticks and that nobody would notice that? And I I bring this up because there's one point where they're flying and Moody's like, hard left, hard left. There's a muggle looking up like they <laughs> right? clearly yeah. know people can see them. So what is this? Well, let's think about this literally. So, yes, on the climb up you do risk being caught. But if they're several hundred feet up into the air under the cover of darkness, they probably wouldn't be seen, Yeah, right? that part I'm okay with. I'm talking about literally being in, in a, a muggle garden yeah. <laughs> and all these people taking off on broomsticks. And yeah. the neighbors are always watching. This is one of those neighborhoods. Yeah. Where... Yeah. So I was wondering, is there some, is there something special about Lily's blood magic that also extends to making any magic performed within the parameters of Privet Drive not visible to other muggles? Like, what if at night all the residents in the neighborhood are just inside watching TV? You know? Well, we see Moody has the put outer in this chapter. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he used the put outer on the inside, but we didn't hear it because they crashed into the kitchen i think maybe they apparated into the kitchen how do they even get in the i don't really understand but um but yeah so i just think that it's it's uh, a really good question that you're yeah. asking because it seems risky for sure yeah they should have all had disillusionment charms on them i guess and to further that point what about when they land in grimwald place they land in an open park is, are, are you yeah. telling me that area is so run down that there's not one person who would see a group of nine plus Harry land in a park on broomsticks? Public property. Nobody's walking their dog. And that's before he puts out the lights. Exactly. Yeah, I was thinking that. And like, I, it was a little easier for me to buy this because she established it as like, okay, like there's broken windows, like maybe not a lot of people don't live in this neighborhood, maybe it's deserted. I'm like, okay, I can suspend my disbelief for that. 
but Privet Drive, I'm like, people clearly live here. And it seems like it doesn't matter what time of day you're leaving. You should be exercising better safety precautions. Maybe this is indicative of how aurors work, which is if they them like they're they're clearly preparing Harry to be attacked by Death Eaters or something like that. Like their focus is on concealing Harry specifically and only him. And one of them says something like, if we die, like if we don't make it, you know, we're going to do this and this and this. So they're preparing for what ends up happening during the seven potters of just like an ambush. So maybe their theory is we don't need to account for anyone who sees us because we have people at the ministry, like the the memory eraser people that can just go out and fix anyone who sees them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So they're big. Th- maybe that standard operating procedure for ours is to not think about the muggle consequences necessarily i know like you said like moody says we gotta turn left but it um i think maybe they're just like because they're preparing for so much of a higher level that anything like this is just bureaucratic they could just like send an intern to go wipe some memories maybe they all drank felix (laughs) felicis there you go one question i did have though is given the experience level of the advanced guard what kind of level is the rear guard. We hear about them very briefly, but I wonder who makes up the rear guard. They have to be more talented in a way, I would think, if if this group of people falls. I was wondering the same thing. Who are they? Yeah. You can't mention them and not at least give us a hint who's in it. Well, she can and she did. Is it like... When Dungus Fletcher is in it. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> Dung, uh, S- Snape. Dumbledore. Um, let's- <laughs> Dumbledore's like okay he's got to be in the rear guard yeah wow I don't think they would be better you think of like a baseball team you have those players that are the backups that never actually play because they the bench suck. players yeah the bench players yeah but, but the rear guard is there just in case the rest of everyone else dies and Harry which is still unlikely be- despite what Moody says yeah yeah um so that's pretty much the end of the chapter they land and Harry is given the slip of paper which we know that is written by Dumbledore. Uh, And it says that the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix is located at number 12, Grimwald Place. And I look forward to talking about the physics of Grimwald Place in the weeks ahead. I just, I don't get it. I don't (laughs) get it. It's just like the movie, right? Right. But when the house comes into existence, the people in the homes next door aren't stretched, aren't squeezed. Yeah, well, the house was always there, but it was our perception of the house that changed. But when you walk into those neighboring homes and you turn to the left or right, there's nothing there. Anyway, we we can talk talk about it later. Sure. Um, (laughs) One thing that uh, did not change this chapter is the Umbridge suck count. I tried, you guys. (laughs) I tried to pin something on Umbridge, but I I can't. Nothing. Okay. Well, that's okay. We don't want our blood to boil too much <laughs> throughout this chapter by chapter series. Right. But over at Connecting the Threads, we have a couple uh, here, uh, including a specific mention of book three. So Harry's on his broomstick. He's very, very cold. It's raining. He wishes he brought a jacket. And he's reminded of the Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff Quidditch match in book three, uh, where the Dementors attacked him. So. Uh, really just the Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix connections are going pretty strong, and this is a, a direct mention of it, so I thought that was um pretty cool. We already talked about Daedalus Diggle being mentioned in book one on while they were in the same physical location, Privet Drive. Um, also, Petunia and Vernon back to form, their self-absorption uh, is a recurring theme throughout all of the books. And you guys added some. Yeah, so we see Harry meet Lupin again uh, for the first time since book three. And Lupin is able to identify Harry by asking Harry to confirm the form that his Patronus takes. Also a really nice callback to Prisoner of Azkaban. And at this point in both Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix, Harry's experiencing this general anxiety about being expelled from Hogwarts and forced to live as a fugitive. Um, So that was also a nice callback. 
Yeah, and then in chapter three of, of Prisoner of Azkaban, it's the night bus that rescues Harry. And in this chapter, also chapter three of Order of the Phoenix, it's the advance guard that ends up rescuing Harry. And uh, I also thought about this as we were recording. In both of the chapter three is we're introduced indirectly in Prisoner of Azkaban to the actual Prisoner of Azkaban Sirius, even though he's in dog form. And then we're introduced to the Order of the Phoenix indirectly again with the advance guard in, in this chapter. Oh, very cool. I like that. And we did leave out one member of the advance guard, and I think he's probably important given his role uh, later on in the series. Oh. And, and that was Elpheus Doge. Oh, yes. Um, also because I think we could potentially see him in Fantastic Beasts. I definitely agree. I can't believe we overlooked him, but Dumbledore's best friend from childhood who was going to travel the world with him had dragon pox growing up. Dumbledore's sister dies. He can no longer travel the world and he ends up writing Dumbledore's obituary. Yeah. I can't believe we overlooked him. Um, time for MVP of the week. Andrew, who's your MVP? Mine are hands. For dealing what? with evil people, Harry. Um, <laughs> what? Thank you, what? Hands. What? Your hands. What is... Huh? They're going through a lot. Ron, Hermione's, Sirius's hands get pecked. Oh. <laughs> I And, you know, they have to deal with that. And then thinking later and what Umbridge does to Harry's hands. Now it makes sense. Good You're job, right. hands. All right. Well, I will uh, then give my MVP of the week to Hedwig. Not for pecking at people's hands, but just for being loyal to Harry, really being the only friend that he has and, and giving up her dinner yeah, to go and, and do what Harry is asking of her. She can't even finish that frog before being sent back out of the house. Poor Hedwig. <laughs> I'm going to give mine to Mad Eye for staying vigilant. Got to give it to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good to practice what you preach. That's for sure. Constant vigilance. <laughs> You you sounded so much like Brad Neely, the um, the Harry, wizard people, dear reader guy, right there, Andrew. Oh, yeah, that was that was classic. Um, I gave my MVP of the week to Tonks because I just think it's endlessly funny that she dream dreamed up this whole England's best kept lawn competition, and that that's the plan they the the order goes with to get Harry out. So, like they they could have just shown up and put Dursleys to sleep. But they did. They didn't. They they did something exceptionally cruel. So I've got to give my MVP of the week to Lupin for being the one person out of a group of nine to instantly be able to calm Harry down when his emotions are all over the place. Yeah. Thank you, Lupin. And now let's rename the chapter Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter Three. We're all gonna die. <laughs> Is that your... We didn't talk about it, but Moody was really grim when he was laying out the mission. Interesting choice of word there, Andrew. Grim. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, was that your... Yeah, uh, totally did that on purpose. Your Brendan Gleeson impersonation as Mad-Eye? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I couldn't think of a good chapter title, so I had to add, a, add an yeah, interesting voice. This was it. a tough Save one. It. This was a tough one. I went with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 3. <laughs> Actually, your lawn's a piece of shit, Dursley, and so are you. <laughs> <laughs> i went with harry potter and the order of the phoenix chapter three check your buttocks <laughs> that's a good one too that's forgot good, all about that yeah another good moody joke throughout he's very much comic relief i went with chapter ugh, order of the phoenix harry potter and the order of the phoenix chapter three pink hair don't care talks a punk everybody I went with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 3, The Boy Who Sassed. Oh, I love it. Ooh, I like it. If you have any feedback about today's discussion, email it in, mugglecast at gmail.com, or use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also call us, one nine two zero three muggle or like I said earlier, record a voice memo with your phone and email it to mugglecast at gmail.com. That's actually kind of cool, because it's higher audio quality, as we heard Uh from Michael's message earlier in today's episode. Time now for Quizage. 
Yes, last week's question, what is the make and model of Nymphadora Tonks's broom? She actually uh, elects to tell Harry that she is riding a Comet 260. She's impressed, mightily impressed by his Firebolt. Congratulations to the people who submitted the correct answers over on Twitter. They include Sarah Davis, Doll Hearts, Joe Tyner, Mary Willis, Orange Gopher 9, Greg and Polka, Patrona Seeker, Mare Muggle 13, and Retta Gambo, among others. Uh, we are posting tweets with all of your names in them, your little at, your little uh, handles. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Uh, handles over on Twitter now in lieu of reading everybody's full name out on the show, just to save some time. And next week's question uh, is as follows. To what does Fred Weasley equate time hmm. in the next chapter the concept okay. the concept of time uh it's got to be an eagle-eyed reader of chapter four number 12 grimald place to find that all right you can play quizage on twitter our username is mugglecast we're also on instagram and facebook where we are also mugglecast please like or follow us you'll be able to stay up to date on on the show with the latest harry potter news some behind the scenes looks at the shows some fun memes that we find, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for following us on social media. We just crossed 4,000 followers on Instagram, y'all. Woohoo, Milestone. Woo Let's go. <laughs> Let's go where? To 5, Let's 000? go to Boston. Oh. What are you doing in Boston, Micah? Just me. No, uh, Eric and I will be at LeakyCon Boston just a few weeks away at this point. It is October 10th through the 13th uh, at the Seaport World Trade Center. And actually, we have some news. I think we can share this, right, Eric? Oh, finally. I think we can. Yeah, I think we finally. can, yes. So uh, there will be three main panels that Eric and myself will be participating in. Eric is actually doing a couple of others as well, which I'm sure uh, he can talk about. But we will be doing sort of a retrospective panel called Podcasting with Potter. Uh, that's going to be on October 11th from 315 to 415. Uh, we're going to be doing a joint session with the folks over at Pottercast called Name That Character. Leaky Mug. What? <laughs> it's Here's our Leaky Mug, basically. Yes. Yeah. You know yeah. what? I actually, we haven't talked about this, but we should mix the teams up. Whoa, it shouldn't just oh. be us versus Pottercast. We we should have fun with this. No, it should absolutely be us. This is this is the old rivalry. We have to sh put in a good. Do you not want to work with me? Is that the problem? Well, we need a th we need a third. We it can't just be three <laughs> we'll on the, two. We we need to find a third. We'll get an audience member. We'll get, we'll an, get audience an audience member. member. Okay. Yeah. Um. That will be on Saturday from three fifteen to four fifteen, and then our live Muggle Cast will be taking place on Sunday the thirteenth. 11.30 to 12.30. Um, all of the things that we've just mentioned actually will be on the main stage and we will be joined. Thanks to Eric for, for making this happen. Also, thanks for Leaky for letting us do this. Uh, we'll be joined by Chris Rankin, who played Percy Weasley in the Potter series. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So our live show will be 11.30 to 12.30 on Sunday. And then, uh, of course, we're going to set up some time to do a a MuggleCast meetup sometime throughout the weekend. Details still be determined there, but uh, we can finally announce what we're going to be doing uh, at LeakyCon yeah. in Boston. Super exciting. Something Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for all of you who are joining. If you want to get tickets uh, and you still haven't, use our discount code MUGGLE to get $10 off. Uh, and all of those times, Micah read, are subject to change until the day of. Course, of. Yeah. But, but uh, it's important to know roughly what we're doing and when we're doing it. So... Uh, super excited, and I'll talk about my other panels later. If you want to, if you can't make it there but want more MuggleCast, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash MuggleCast. We just released a new bonus MuggleCast, which finds us discussing what Dudley heard and felt when the Dementors attacked. We had a good discussion there last week. We do two bonus MuggleCasts per month, plus you get access to our recording studio. We stream live as we record each episode. So you also get some early access. And if you want even earlier access, you can get access to our show notes a few days in advance of each episode. So you can see, so you can see what we're working on. You also have the chance to co-host MuggleCast like Christina did today. Thanks for joining us, Christina. Oh, it was totally worth it. I was so looking forward to this. Good. I well, hope you, it sounds like you had a good time and you threw in some great uh, thoughts during our 
discussion as well. So we really appreciate that. Thanks, thank you for contributing to MuggleCast in all ways. Always. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm um, Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Christina. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Bye.